Hello, and welcome to another episode of Solipsis Watched. I'm your host, The Social Solipsist, and this week I watched North by Northwest from 1959. Now, this is a movie that I think a lot of people know of and a lot of people talk about in cinematic circles, but not a lot of people have necessarily watched and maybe don't talk about directly as much. And I think that's really interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, North by Northwest is a movie that is hard to put a pin a pin on, um, identify exactly what it is, because in many ways it is trailblazing in a lot of facets. Um, it is in a weird way, kind of a very significant bridge between what I see as two not completely distinct, but somewhat distinct eras of cinema. Things we've talked about before as far as genre goes, as far as um, the subjects and details of the narratives being told, and as far as the way that actors are used and portrayed uh, in movies and, and the industry as a whole. Um, so to have a movie by Hitchcock, um, be one of the, you know, iconic movies of, of, of a turning generation is not a surprise on its own. Um, Hitchcock earned his reputation for a good reason. However, for me as somebody who has had less direct experience and less, um, wasn't there obviously for watching as that cinema turned over and who hasn't heard too many people talk directly about this movie other than to say that it's very good and it's a much must watch um it's it kind of threw me for a loop in a very good way um i had some preconceived notions going into this and in fact that was part of the reason i hadn't watched it um more readily prior to this. I've watched a few Hitchcock films um, uh, and I always enjoy them. Hitchcock is a master of his craft, no doubt. He earned his reputation, like I said, for a good reason. Um, but the movies of his that I've watched, um, in particular things like Psycho, The Birds, uh, Vertigo, um, I be believe Rebecca is also him. Uh, they are difficult to digest. Um, they're not easy watching. Um, a lot of those fall into sort of horror or horror adjacent things, thrillers and those sorts of things. And he loves to play with um, cinematic language in ways that are sometimes kind of shocking. Um, even to modern sensibilities. Um, but, and, you know, so I have this preconceived notion of what I might be getting with Hitchcock. Um, and the details around this film don't necessarily betray what it is under the surface. So I had gone into this with certain assumptions that this might be at least adjacent to some of those those expectations and what I had seen before. What I was not really prepared for was that this would take so many twists and turns, both narratively and thematically. This ties in a whole bunch of different genres, and I'm going to be careful to not even mention what they are because I don't want to betray uh, what this movie is until later in this video when I will signpost this a little bit better. Um, this is uh, a melding of so many genres and really the creation of at least one new one as well. It is iconic in that in that sense in a way that I was not aware of at all. But it turns out looking at the history, apparently it was looked upon in that way and in cinematic circles afterwards. Um, I'll come back to that. 
this movie for being made, um, what, 65 years ago? Something like that? Uh, no, wait a minute. S- yeah, 1959? It's, yeah, something like that. A- anyway, for being made quite a long time ago, <laughs> um, looks fantastic. Uh, it has uh, unsurprisingly gotten a very good quality um, transfer for a well-renowned film. Um, But that doesn't change the fact that some of the core filming and the core processing and editing done to this film in its original form looks fantastic. A lot of Hitchcock's films are black and white, and he is a master of black and white, no doubt about that. Um, There are... Some some of his later films, and obviously he he made films for a very long time, um, would be color, and it's clear that he knew how to work with um, color as soon as it was sort of something he wanted to do. Uh, and this is a bright, beautiful, colorful film that uses light and darkness and color very much to its advantage for all kinds of storytelling to the point of it being um, some elements of it being the kind of um, theatrical color, theatrical lighting of a very obvious, this is, you know, lighting that's only supposed to be there for the purposes of the viewer, but we're not distracted by it. It seems plausible. The, 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 like everything is all the light sources sort of make sense, but they are used, exaggerated to an extent to um, really beautify what is on screen. And that goes for any kind of scene um, that goes throughout this film. This film just looks fantastic. It also has um, just great camera work all the time, great direction, no surprise, again, with Hitchcock. Um, good shot selection, some really nice camera movement stuff. I don't think steady cam was a thing until the seventies. Um, don't quote me on that, but that's my recollection. Uh, and so there are some things that look like they might, they're handheld. They might be on a, on a dolly. Um, but things just look incredibly uh, fantastic. Even now, um, again, no surprise. I'm going to probably say that too much. Um, the, uh, in addition to all that, the sets, and there are many, there are many locations, um, in this film that go everywhere from like small rooms to enormous rooms full of people, um, uh, to outdoors, um, in, you know, just the weirdest place you would not expect to be for this movie. Um, It goes all over and every scene looks fantastic. There are certain elements that if you're really nitpicking, you could say, man, that didn't age well, but I would tend to disagree. And I'm going to, that, that I'm going to specifically point towards some of the uh, analog compositing that was being done at the time. This is very common for, all kinds of, well, even now. Um, but, uh, the use of matte painting and, um, like secondary projection systems and stuff like that to allow for the compositing of, uh, actors into locations where they aren't or to, um, put two scenes together to make them, um, to make one, you know, cohesive scene really really well done through and through um also you know those some those same techniques are used to do uh incredible things that are not actually possible or wouldn't have been possible sometimes with a camera and technology of the time uh, sometimes things that aren't even possible now that would probably just be done with cg these days um but that's the beauty of using some of those traditional techniques like map painting um is you can you can really compose something that's sort of out of this world. Um, and that is all served by, uh, 
a score that I think, while not specifically really remarkable, is very strong and uh, an incredible cast that puts on fantastic performances um, from end to end. This is not only our lead characters, but um, every minor character, and there are many throughout the, the course of this film. This is a very complicated film as well. This is a runtime of like two hours and 15 minutes, I think. And uh, it it is not, it, it keeps a fantastic pace. The, the pacing is really good and it is moving at a quick clip through, uh, throughout its entire run in a way that I think is not completely uh, unusual, but kind of unusual for the time. Um, put a pin in that when we talk about genre. The, the way that this all comes together is incredibly satisfying. Fantastic performances filmed fantastically on fantastic sets with great um, costuming as well. Almost missed that one. Costuming is a star in this film everything from characters who change their clothes all the time to characters who never change their clothes to the point that um Cary grant's character's uh suit is so iconic um that it's really like defined a whole series of fashion waves um you can see like some of the the influences in the design of his suit and anyway um that's a the, the suit is a character unto itself it's fantastic uh and i just really appreciate everything that's put together here to make for such a satisfyingly well-made film it's also incredibly well written um there's a few beats here and there that i think are a little bit um giving there, there's sometimes they don't give the the audience enough credit. They could have taken a little bit out here and there. Um, but generally speaking, I would actually compliment this film very much for being willing to say nothing. Um, this is something you've heard me compliment before. Sometimes the right thing to do is to have a scene where characters say very little or nothing at all. Uh, and um, that's really then served by the things like the music and the um, any sound effects that are uh, in those scenes as well because those tell you so much and that starts right in the first scene um, there that is also not saying things and showing them is also unsurprisingly an incredible forte of the film where so much is told in the visual realm without anything being said or directed to or sometimes even acknowledged by the camera um, there is something to be said for early or films earlier than this one where it was very common that if you needed the audience to ensure that the audience acknowledged a certain aspect of um, the scene you'd place an insert shot to ensure that they sort of got the point and this film is not without those but it is willing to give more leeway or to hint at what needs to be looked at or um, to acknowledge in other ways whether it's movements of the the actors etc etc uh this is a truly fantastic film that i will definitely be watching again um, because I think there's so much to absorb out of it. And at this point, I'm going to start getting into talking about genre, which starts to get a little bit spoilery for your expectations. I'm not going to talk, well, if I talk about the plot specifically, I'll, I'll signpost that separately. But right now, I'm just going to talk about genre. So take your pick whether you should uh, bow out here or not. I highly recommend this film, and I do think if you haven't watched it and are going to, you should probably just pause it here and come back. Um, but yeah, come back and let me know what you think of what I'm going to say next, which is that this movie starts out really as something that feels a little bit more to me of what my expectations are of uh, Hitchcock, which is sort of a mystery thriller with a lot of things up in the air. The movie starts out with the character 
in an unfamiliar situation. Um, we establish who his character is and then throw him into a situation he doesn't understand and is trying to um, resolve in whatever way. This is a very traditional, very common um, uh, scenario. You see it all the time. And it's a very loose framework, obviously. Um, but the, the way that the plot swings around really hits on a whole bunch of genres. So while it starts very much on the sort of um, the thriller side of things, it very quickly incorporates a whole bunch of aspects of noir cinema. And this is something interesting because we've been talking about it um, previously, and I'm even going to have to take back or at least acknowledge some differences between this and what I've said prior about sort of what a noir is uh what noir is and isn't this is not a noir film by any stretch of the imagination and um that's not just because of the shooting style or something like that but it certainly plays to some noir tropes um things like the 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 femme fatale and um the sort of the these are things that you'll pick up very quickly as a modern movie watcher i think but for the time might have been either not as obvious or only obvious if you had been sort of in the in the sort of pulp fiction and noir um realm of cinema and media in general um there's a lot of uh in, in including to include uh, in addition to character archetypes there's scenarios that read um as as a very sort of noir um interactions between characters and the way that the main character adapts to his scenario reads very much as sort of the the sort of um uh hard-boiled detective type even when Grant's character is not a detective. His character really has an arc throughout this film that is some a little bit unbelievable if you pick at it too much, where he goes from being sort of a, a random guy, seemingly, to being rather capable in a whole bunch of different scenarios. However, it does balance very carefully um, to not make him leak like overly competent competent and uh overly capable in a way that's unbelievable these are everything he does is done in a way that is uh, i could understand why he might do that or why he might um like have that intuition or have that particular skill um and that gets into sort of that that noir detective thing of like the noir detective is a little bit of a like jack of all trades he always knows how to do this that and the other thing whatever is needed to push his his uh investigation forward um what's even more interesting as this goes along is that this starts to show the signs of becoming a spy thriller uh which is really as i'm thinking about it kind of a synthesis of these previous genres that it's showing at the beginning of the film more clearly and obviously it's impossible for me to go back in time unwatch the film and try and reconsider whether or not it is um it is a spy film from the beginning the knowledge necessary to realize that i need to be thinking that way without already having seen it is you know it's a paradox anyway but it's it's an interesting thought process of just was this always a spy thriller from the beginning and we just sort of didn't know it? Or is it literally inventing this genre in a way on the fly? Now, it's obviously not inventing the genre. Uh, spy fiction was um, something that greatly preceded this, uh, especially um, spy fiction around the, well, especially World War II was something that had been sort of persistent even as that war was going on and this is quite some time later um, however as far as setting certain cinematic tropes for spy cinema and especially james bond this is the movie this is the first james bond movie it doesn't really look like it and 
it's it's not obviously by name, but in a lot of ways, even down to the way that things are shot, the way that the character carries himself, um, and the sort of the behaviors around the character, I'm not gonna say that um, Ian Fleming took this character to write his books or anything like that but it, those those cross influences are very obvious i believe the first bond film was not made until like three years after this maybe longer um and you can see those influences if you've got the, the bond is a whole separate topic and the early bond films are rough this is a better film than a bunch of the Bond films, especially the early ones. Um, they're rough around the edges. But it's so interesting to see that... I, I don't know how you could look at this film and then look at the Bond films and deny the very direct, obvious influences that are there. Um, so the, the way this evolves into, um, you know, being about both both narratively and like structure like structurally thematically you inventing tropes or or using tropes that are notable in spy cinema but at the time were sort of i mean spy cinema wasn't really a thing up to that point so having them show up first here and then be used later is so interesting to me especially as we're talking about um that we've been talking about for some weeks now this cross uh these these the way that cinema evolved from being from needing certain certain types of narratives to exist at certain points in history um where cowboys start to peter out because they're no longer that that sort of cultural narrative is no longer really really prevalent really relevant you start getting different kinds of heroes different kinds of villains um, and talking about the sort of way that um, socioeconomics and class and now in the post-world war ii era getting um, the the international stage to be more of a uh, more relevant to the narratives being written those influences are are all so present in this film and while it's not the first in any respect to any of the things it really does it's such a creative synthesis um, that i think it deserves immense credit in that regard um I don't think i'm going to actually talk about any of the specifics of the plot because i don't think i really need to uh, if you've weren't already sold hopefully you're sold now go watch it if you're not then i don't i mean maybe it's just not your not your thing but at least at the at even if you don't like the genre but you like cinema i think this deserves watching if only for all of the stages it sets for cinematic history going forward but it's also an incredible film on its own and deserves to be seen um i'm really still very i'm like borderline shocked by this film by how how good it is how influential it is and all of the things that it now all of the other things i've watched that now have new context to be able to go oh that i can trace lineage back to this movie it's so fascinating to me it's one of the things I really like about art in general and in particular cinema um, for being able to understand like the influences of an art, an art form and of the artists who make it. Anyway, great film. Highly recommend it. Uh, probably no surprise there. Uh, thank you guys for watching another episode of Solipsis Watched. I've been your host, The Social Solipsist, and I'll see you guys next time.